Support for the Dice Tower comes from listeners like you and from The Op, also known as USAopoly. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, Episode 651. 15 years ago, 2005. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Jeff examines quantum computing, and we look at questions about our gaming weaknesses, acquiring replacement parts for games, and the pluses and minuses of two-wave shipping. Then we look back 15 years with our top 10 games from 2005. I'm Eric Summerer, and joining me now, the YouTube to my Hulu, Tom Vassell. Was Netflix come out in 2005? No, no, I'm just saying that, that uh, you are essential in this, uh, this time of ours. And, uh, and, and I, I just decided to go with another one, Hulu. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting time uh, to be alive, folks. It is. And it's even more interesting because we record these podcasts in the future. Now, we only record this one, what, one, two, three, four, five days ahead of time. Something right? like that. That's what we've always done. Yeah, yeah. But in 2020, five days is an immense amount of time. <laughs> it is. Well, from, from the last time we talked to each other here on this show, two, we- two weeks, a lot has changed. Yes. That's true. That's true. And so if you're listening to this way, 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 way in the future, in the year 2030, um, in 2020, our lives were changed dramatically for at least a week and highly probably much longer than that weeks to come i think yes due to the coronavirus uh and so yeah it's an interesting thing we're not gonna folks if you are tuning into our podcast to get away from that we're not going to expound upon this much all right there's enough of that in the news we're just mentioning that it definitely has changed our lives some for the better Mm -hmm. i have my daughter and her fiance uh from college came home that's cool here for a while so i got a built-in gaming group that i really did the cracking on games <laughs> and um yeah but this weekend i mean really i have a lot of time to play games more than ever before so there's that and folks if you're looking for somewhere to go and to talk we're doing a chat or some sort of live dice tower video every night mm. around 9 p.m so jump in whether it's uh, me talking to someone or dice tower tonight or something or other Come on board and say hi to us. Yeah. Tom joined us for Dice Tower tonight, uh, last night, which would be last week, uh, if you're watching the archives. And that was fun to have you back on the show. We had a good time. So because of this, I'm sure we have a lot of chance to talk about games here. And we'll talk about them, well, right now. But what I want to do here is I want to start with Eric. And we're going to do all three of Eric's games. Oh. Mostly because... These are games I've already talked about, and so I'd like to hear Eric's opinions of them. Yes. Uh, well, this is the, sort of my theme for the episode. Tom often uh, here on this show will say, I think this is one you would enjoy. And all three of these games are games that Tom has highlighted on this program as ones that I would like. So we'll start. And we'll, we'll find out whether Tom is, is right. Is he, is he right? I'm also going to get my updated opinions on each of them. Okay. Uh, let's start with The Crew, which is now, at least from what I'm seeing on Twitter, available in English. I got my English copy from Cosmos, uh, which has upgraded uh, quality cards. They now have linen finish cards. The Crew is a cooperative trick-taking game in which uh, the players are trying to usually achieve a mission that involves getting a certain card to a certain player, and the missions get more uh, complex as you go. There are 50 different missions, uh, different scenarios to achieve. Um, Sometimes you have to do the tricks in certain orders, like the blue two has to go to someone before the pink six does, and trying to figure out how to do that is a nice brain twister and a twist on the trick-taking mechanism. Now, I mentioned this on Dice Tower tonight, uh, that I used this to teach the concept of trick-taking to my children. And... um, it, it it went relatively well. I was a little worried uh, in, in trying to use this as a teaching tool, but they got the concept. They are still learning to um, to not necessarily win every trick. 
Uh, my youngest certainly wants to try and win. If he has a nine or an eight in his hand and he can play it, he'll usually want to play it because he wants to win. But that's not necessarily the best thing to do for the the mission uh, that you're trying to complete. But they're learning and we're making progress. I think the boys and I are now on level 10 or 11. Um, and when my wife has joined us, we haven't gotten nearly as far. We're only on like three or four. But I played this with my group, my my game group. We started we threw it out just to try it out. You know, maybe we'll do a couple hands as sort of a time filler um, while we we wait to play something larger. And we ended up playing it all night long. Uh, went like 20 hands, got through 15 missions. The Crew is a terrific game twist on the, uh, on the trick-taking genre and its co-op, which has me sold. The fact that it works for my kids, too, and they keep asking to play it. I played it tonight before recording tonight. So huge thumbs up. For the crew. Yeah, so I stand by that this is going to be one of the most played games and talked about games years from now. I think mm. this is an instant classic. I This is still my favorite trick-taking game, definitely in my top 10 cooperative games. And it's one of those games where I do not know how to explain the just sheer thinky pleasure I get from sitting down with several other people who are also quite good at trick-taking games, mm. and we puzzle it out together Yeah, secretly. It's so good. Yes. It's also a Pringles game in the sense that you play around and you immediately want to play another one. And, and let, let's yeah, just do one true. more. I let's just do one more. It's great. No one's playing this once. No. Uh, hey, future Eric here. Uh, I know that we're sticklers for accuracy here on the Dice Tower, and I just wanted to mention that uh, it's not the Pringles jingle that's uh, – you can eat just one, or you can't eat just one. I think that's Lay's potato chips. I'm I'm very sorry for you Lay's fans out there. Anyway. Yeah, great. Great, the crew. I like it. What else? The Isle of Cats uh, is a a polyomino uh, drafting game. And you are you have a big ship and you are collecting tiles in all sorts of wacky shapes that represent these fantasy themed cats. Lovely little illustrations of them all lounging around. And you're trying to cover as many spaces on your ship as possible, also covering up the rats that are pre-printed. You're trying to fill in rooms that are printed on your ship. You're also trying to achieve certain goals, like maybe you have to get the entire perimeter covered uh, with your, your boat or, or make one big long line down the center. If the, if the big long row along the middle of your boat is filled, you'll get points. Uh, this is all achieved through drafting of cards. Uh, you, you start a round and you'll draft cards as they go around the table, and then you'll play some of them that give you um, turn order uh, initiative that will allow you to collect more cats than other players on your turn, and also give you secret and public scoring objectives. Um, that, like that, get all the perimeter is something that would be face down uh, next to your playing area that you would then score at the end of the game. But then there are other objectives that are public for everyone and uh, may add or subtract points for achieving or not achieving certain goals. And once uh, you have the initiative, then you do a sort of a drafting slash purchase phase of these different cat shapes. They come in different colors, they come in different shapes, and you're trying to make groups of the same color cats and also cover up as efficiently as possible the spaces on your ship. Um, a lot to like here. Uh, this is I like the uh, the drafting and the the tactical nature of the the acquisition of getting the cats. That shape will really work for me. But then there are cards that can bring out more cats, and some cats are more expensive than others. And so, are you willing to pay more? There's sort of an economy going on here. It's neat. I like it a lot. It comes in a huge box though, and if you don't have the Kickstarter edition, it's weird how big that box is. Um, but it's still really cool. Yeah, that's true. I think it could have come in a slightly smaller box. But other than that, I think this is one of those games that will be at the end of the year on many, many, many top ten lists. And it's definitely one of the more played games at the Dice Tower West. It was played quite a bit. It was. I had to basically get there very early in the morning to play on the hot games table to get to play Isle of Cats. But I, I did like it. I'm, I'm considering hunting down a copy of this for myself because I think my wife would like it too. Last, for me, is a game called Dominations, uh, which is a combination of dominoes and nation-building. It's a civilization-building game that uses these triangular tiles to build a landscape, and you're trying to match up uh, colors in the corners of these triangular tiles that get you currency, knowledge points, in six different uh, suits. 
for lack of a better word. And this is all tracked on these sliders. You get this big track with six columns, and you, you slide these things up and down. And at the beginning of the game, you can only get like five points in each of the different colors. But then as you build more cities on these different colored tiles, you gain more ability to store more of these knowledge points. Uh, you buy technologies uh, with these knowledge points that, that allow you to break rules and do cool stuff. You, you will be matching up the tiles that have these technologies on them to earn more points. Uh, you have goals that your civilization has that you're trying to achieve by the end of the game, and it's kind of cool to work toward those because it many of these will take you most of the game to get through. Uh, and you can also build these cool monuments and, uh, and landmarks um, that have special scoring opportunities as well. And those are all like cardboard cutout like the Colossus of Rhodes uh, is this big cardboard cutout yes. that fits into the landscape in a particular way. Um, so conceptually, this is really neat. I was a little overwhelmed by the menu of choices you are presented with. There are like eight player aid cards. There's one, one player aid card for each of the different suits and the different techs you can buy for that suit that have both the basic and the advanced versions of those techs. And then I think there's a turn order uh, player aid card and then maybe one just for fun. It, it's, a, it's at seven or eight player aids that you have just stacked up in front of you. And so I, I found it a little overwhelming. And in fact, we had to bail before we were totally done with the game because one of our players had to leave. Uh, it was just getting too late. He had a volunteer shift in the morning and that was you – know, we got through two out of the three epics. Um, so I can't fully say whether the arc pays off by the end, um, but I was – I wanted to mention I'm a little annoyed at some of the production issues with this game. Um, many of the tiles were very bendy. Um, those tracks were – they're like a two-layer track that have sliders that go up up a little channel. And um, – it sort of made a U-shape on the table. That's how warped it ended up being. Um, and the way those sliders work, they don't – it's like the, the the track wasn't quite long enough to allow this slider to clearly delineate uh, where it is on the track. And, and a couple players were lining it up so that it covered the number that they had of that resource and others were sliding it so it was just below the number. And it made it confusing looking around the table and it's just one of these usability issues – Plus six colors, six little dots in different colors on all of these uh, tiles that have no other differentiation other than that color. And even for someone who isn't colorblind, it's very difficult to tell the difference between some of these colors. I think there's a purple and a blue um, and I think an orange and a red and it was very tricky to try and tell the difference between some of these from across the table. So I'm a, I'm a little annoyed. This isn't one that I am seeking out in the future, I think. I don't think I like this one as much as Tom thought I would. Um, but that could be that it was a late night and it wasn't a full game. So I'm reserving full judgment. No, and that's a reasonable thing. Uh, so now I, I've been playing this more and I played it actually with all the expansions. Oh. Which are both interesting and not necessary. <laughs> in, in my okay. opinion, I do agree with Eric that this that they could have done better on these ways to keep track of those resources, especially since it is a fundamental part of the game. Very much. I'm probably going to get some little wooden tokens and replace mine with those. Hmm. And even though they won't slide up as nicely, uh, every single game I played of this now, fifty percent of the people insist that the that the token is on top of the number of resources, and the correct other half, which includes me, yeah, it's underneath. Insists that it's rounded for a reason, so it goes mm -hmm. underneath. And yet, I understand why they think so. Yeah, it, because of the just, way the beginning and the end of the track is built. It's just not quite lining up properly. Yes, it's it's very unclear, and especially yeah. if you bump it. And so, or someone is bookkeeping differently. And it is actually important to know what your opponents have in some of these because there are bonuses for having the most of red at the end of the round, uh, end of the epic, that you, you sort of need to know if they have four or five red at the end of a round. And, and not being able to know that for sure is tricky. So if you get tokens, how will you um, initiate the, the limits on these different colors? Yeah. Well, because there's actually two sliders on each of these. There's a there's sort of a cap, and then there's your current, you know, stop. You're right. Oh, that's the other thing on the. So the the track 
has, you know, numbers 1 through 5 and then numbers 6 through 10. But these limiters also exist on a space. And so once you've moved the limiter up to the 10 or the 15 or even the 20, now there it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, blank, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, blank. And that is super frustrating because if you're just slide, although I, I earn three red and you move up the tracker, one, two, three, you may hit the blank. And if you aren't paying attention and actually doing the math, instead of just sliding up your slider, you may stiff yourself a point. And that's super frustrating. And again, something that it's a fundamental part of the game. <sighs> Despite that, I love this game, folks. <laughs> I don't know how much to, to tell you that. I'm thinking I'm going to play it with only two or three hmm. at max, but man, the a number of options you have, the number of techs you can build, it's so fascinating, all the things you can do on your turn. I, I need to give it another go. All right. Let's talk about some fairly simple games here. We'll start with Offshore. Offshore is from Aporta Games. Now, Aporta Games has made a lot of stuff that I really like, like Automania. Yep. Uh, this is a game about building oil rigs in the sea, and essentially the way this game works is you have three actions you can take in your turn. You go collect basically a technology tile, or you're going to start an oil rig in a spot on the board. There's various spots on the board, and these spots need combinations of technology tiles. So maybe I have a red and a yellow technology tile, but I want to start an oil rig in a certain spot, and it needs a red, yellow, and blue. I don't have a blue, so I ask Eric to help me. You can ask one other person to help you. Well, I mean, you can ask anybody to help you, but you can only take one person with you. Okay. So you need the correct combination of tiles. These technology tiles also give you some sort of bonus when you go there, so that may pick things. I might pick Eric because Eric's technology tile will give me extra oil when we go to this spot. But if Suzanne, her tile might uh, – she might – it might just not be as good of a bonus, but she might offer to pay the costs for opening up this oil rig. Okay. So I pick somebody to help me. You don't have to. If you can do the whole thing yourself, but that's that's a rarity. Usually you're going to need other people to help you. So then when you, when you get two people, then you decide that you're going to do essentially a draw from a bag, push your own luck. You start dr drilling for oil, and you draw these tiles one at a time. And if you ever reach four of these time tokens – you bust, hmm. and the last three tokens that you've drawn go, on, go away. But you can keep drawing these tokens, and different tokens will give you money and victory points and oil. And you can have special abilities that let you add it. You can. It takes five tokens for you to bust, or six tokens. You can start going down a little farther, things like that. So there's this push your luck aspect, then you get these oil barrels, and then... The third action you could take in your turn is oil barrels that you've collected. You can sell them at different spots around the board and get money or victory points. Very simple game. Uh, there's, It's like what I would call this would be it's negotiation for sure, but it is controlled negotiation. By that I mean there's only so many things you can negotiate with. So if you don't like these really open-ended games, this one's a little closed in that regard. The box said three to five. I opened it up and set it up for two players and then realized it said three to five on the box. But then I looked in the rules and lo and behold, there were advanced rules for two players. Oh, surprise. Yes. But after playing it with two players, they were correct on not putting two players on the box. That's why it's advanced. You can do it. It's not good. Hmm. Yeah. But I really like it. It's a solid middleweight game. I could see people being a little annoyed. The push your luck aspect can really swing. If you push your luck, sometimes you might do a little better and sometimes you might bust. And you only do it so many times over the course of the game. But this is the game that I want it deep blue to be from Days of Wonder. Hmm. So that's offshore. Cool. The next game is from WizKids, designed by Tim Blank. And it's called Bumuntu. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Sure. It is a strategy game based on the f culture and folklore of the Bakongo tribes in the Kingdom of Congo. So in this game, forget the theme. It's just a straight up abstract strategy game. Okay. It's tons of tiles that you're placing on a grid. The grid is an 8x8 eight eight grid, and you're going to have eight different animals 
in this grid, eight copies of each, you mix them up and you just throw them out in this grid. And then you have this, this pawn that you're moving around the grid. And when you move the pawn off of an animal, you will collect that animal. But when you move off an animal, you move in a very specific way, depending on the animal. Like maybe the zebra, you can move diagonally as far as you want to. The elephant, you can only move two in any direction. Things like that. So if you happen to land on a spot where there's no animal, then next turn, all you can do is move one space in a direction. So you don't you want to try to land on other animals so you can collect these animals. Some animals, when you collect their tiles, will give you food. Food can be, or bananas. Bananas can be spent to move your uh, pawn before doing your actual move. So you might want to move to a specific animal. And other animals, when you that have a brown background, when you collect one of those, you switch the value of animals. See, the whole point is collecting these animals because they're worth points at the end of the game. And at the beginning, you put a title card for each animal next to points on the board. So the best one is two points per animal. The second best one says whoever has the most of that animal gets seven points and so on and so forth. The lowest one, I think whoever has the most gets three points. Hmm. So you can also switch to adjacent ones. So I might say, ah, I'm not collecting a lot of lions. I'm going to switch them with the elephants to make the elephants more valuable. Huh. Okay. There are 10 different animals in the box. You only use eight per game. It's very light, but very good. I think it's better with fewer players. It's two to five. But with fewer players, there's less things changing from turn to turn. There's slight player interactions. There's a few animals that when you do the move on them, you can move somebody else or force someone else to move, trying to move them off of an animal that, that might help them out, etc. But I liked it. Nice high quality tiles too. That's that backlight plastic stuff. Hmm. You know, the same stuff they, you know, some domino sets are made out of. Yeah. And it looks really good. I don't often give WizKids a lot of credit on their production because they don't deserve it on many of their productions. <laughs> okay. But this one I was pretty happy with. All right. So that is Boo Moon 2. And finally, I have this little game that you may or may not have heard of called Magic the Gathering. Uh, yeah, this is... Eric, have you ever played this game? This is an old one, right? Uh, yes, I, I have. Not much. Uh, it's it's something I've just sort of dabbled in with friends and, and haven't probably played a game in at least 10 years. So I'm definitely not up to date on any of the new formats or sets or any of that. Yeah, and I'm I'm definitely not in the Magic the Gathering community. I don't know everything about all the different stuff that goes on, and there's this meta game and new sets, and I, I understand a little bit of it, but not a lot. And so I don't keep up with it because it's a collectible game, but somebody at Dice Tower West showed me what was called a battle box. And the way this works is, is you build this big pile of magic cards, maybe commons, uncommons, and maybe a few rares, but like cheap rares. Mm-hmm. And it's this big communal deck. When you play the game, you just take 40 cards off this deck or something. That's your deck. Okay. It doesn't really matter because if you run out of cards, just grab some more. Oh, sure. Okay. And then you start with – no, but uh, seriously, then you start with 10 lands, one of each of the five basic colors, and then one dual land of each type. Okay. You draw four cards from your deck, and then each turn of the game, you may play one of your lands – and then Magic the Gathering as normal. Hmm. So every every turn, you're putting one land into play. So you can't get messed over by drawing a handful of a lot of lands, or yeah. the uh, opposite, where you draw cards and get you know too many lands or too few lands, whatever it might be. And, you're, and you can't build this overpowered deck because it's impossible. It's this big collective deck, and you're playing all five colors. And it's really fun. Hmm. I really like it. I'm put. I I got a set of this. So the, they helped me find the cards online. I got them all. Put it together. I'm going to put it in Dice Tower Library. Yeah, uh, it's a when, nice casual way to play Magic. Yeah, you. Uh, when we did our top ten M games, uh, I guess two weeks ago, you you mentioned that this was something you were interested in, and I you were thinking about putting in the library. So now you have successfully constructed a set. Did you go with all? commons did you go with uncommons what 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 was your goal well, what in I did assembling was, the cards there was there was no goal 
the person who uh, showed me this Dice Tower West sent me an email with a, a card, a suggested card list. Okay. And I said, great. I don't feel like hiding all this stuff down. Lo and behold, I did not have to. Uh huh. You cut and paste it and put it into this website called TCG Player. Okay. And then what that does is it searches tons of sites and tells you here's the cost of all the cards. Wow. All right, fine. So then I click it. I make one payment, and then I got 62 emails from 62 different stores <laughs> telling Whoa. me they were sending me cards. <laughs> 62 envelopes showed up <laughs> with you know anywhere from one card to 30 cards inside each one. Wow. Yeah, the mailbox was full. If you just want letters in your mailbox. <laughs> I just really want people to write to me. Yeah, it was it was a neat thing. It was uh it was unusual. My wife's like, "Where's uh, I need to search for the real mail bills, whatever." <laughs> There's like one bill in the middle. Yeah, so I mean, it was I will say it was a pain to open all this stuff cuz I opened the envelopes and then they stick the cards in penny sleeves, mm. sometimes inside another penny sleeve, inside mm. a hard sleeve that they then tape up. Oh yeah. And I'm trying to open these things without destroying the cards. Oh yeah. But that's they've that's they've learned how to uh, ship carefully that way. Yeah, it was a really neat experience overall. I really enjoyed it, and I would recommend it. But it's easy for you to do it. This is good for me. I can put this in the Dice Tower Library. People can play it, and at the same time, I'm not too worried about people stealing it because the Magic cards aren't really worth that much. Cool. All righty. All right. Before we jump to our next segment, which is going to be Jeff. I want to say a couple things. One, thank you if you backed our Kickstarter in January. Our thank backer you. kit where you will go in and confirm what you want should be going live this week. If you backed our Kickstarter at all, we're going to be slowly rolling it out and sending it to a few people at a time to make sure it works properly. And then everyone will be, have a chance to go in there. If you want it to be involved in that, we'll have a link to that. You'll be able to go to it just by going to DiceTowerKickstarter.com. We'll redirect that link there once the backer kit is fully live. But uh, that's pretty much – actually, I said I had a couple things. That was pretty much it. Let's jump to Jeff. Okay. Support for the Dice Tower comes from the Op Games, also known as USAopoly. One of their latest releases is the Ops Talisman, Kingdom Hearts Edition. It's the first Kingdom Hearts board game, and it features fan-favorite characters and figures from the video game. Tom, did you play Kingdom Hearts? Yeah, I gotta say, this is one of those games that still kind of blew me away when I was playing it, because I was running around with Mickey Mouse and gang, and suddenly people from Final Fantasy showed up involved, and that just kind of blew my mind that they put all this stuff together. Really beautiful game, and so glad to see it's here now as a board game in the Talisman setting. And it's available now. It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein, where we find out how games really work. You may have heard of quantum computers and how they are going to revolutionize the digital realm. I recently had an opportunity to interview Dr. James Wooten, who is a quantum computing researcher at IBM. He specializes in looking at these powerful machines from a game-centric viewpoint. For one of his projects, he developed a phone app called Hello Quantum, which is a puzzle game that manipula simulates manipulating qubits, which are the fundamental component of a quantum computer. Current quantum computers have tens of qubits, while traditional computers have billions or trillions. How can these systems be comparable? Note that the audio quality on Dr. Witten's side was not great, so please bear with us. These numbers of qubits are the ones that are actively on the device processing information uh, at any one time. And if you want to do it, Something like something number theoretic, you want to, well, add some numbers, for example. So the number of qubits you would need on the device would be around the number of bits you would need to represent these numbers. But, of course, adding is not something we typically want to do. Uh, but then if you look at certain types of problems, if you want to factorize a number of a certain size, uh, then the number of bits that you would need to represent those numbers is, is not huge, but the number of 
bits you would need in the entire process of factorizing it is exponentially large. And uh, that's not true for quantum computers. So this is the kind of then comparison you have to make. So I think what I would say is that you would use quantum computers for tasks that you, you don't even consider using normal computers for. So it's hard to really give a comparison of bit number to qubit number. Uh, for example, if you wanted to simulate one of these 53 qubit quantum computers, the number of bits you would need is probably the number of bits that live on the world's largest supercomputer. So there's kind of the comparison. But, but it's hard it's hard to make a comparison of these things because it's really apples and oranges. The other aspect of games that Dr. Witten is working on is actually using a quantum computer as the heart of a game. Again, apologies for the sound quality. Like you talk about, you know, the, the early use of computers and the first use of computers was to assist in the military and to solve these problems. But like you said, in the 50s and 60s, as they started getting to labs at, at MIT and places like that, they made games like Space War and Adventure and, and realized that, you know, this could be a whole platform of um, not just a game to explain how the computer works, but just the, the computer itself could be a whole new medium to express game ideas. Do you feel that quantum computing, I mean, right now it's, I guess, prohibitively expensive or maybe not, but ultimately do you feel that this will lead to certain types of games or gaming experiences that we can't do now? I think that it will help. Uh, I think that the creation of games is something where uh, game designers uh, can always use whatever tools are available to them to make new experiences. And uh, I've been trying to more rigorously think about exactly where in games uh, quantum computers could help. And one area I think is uh, a very good hope is procedural generation. Because uh, in procedural generation, you need to be able to make content, and that content has to be as different from the last content as possible. But it has to satisfy certain constraints, like a puzzle should be solvable, a level could, should be completable. But you might also want to get some information like, what is the best way to solve this level? So you can offer the player some feedback. And all of these things can be quite computationally hard problems, uh, but they're all things that also quantum computers could help out with. So sometimes when you see procedurally generated content, you get the impression that it's the same stuff just stuck together in different ways in order to skirt around some of these computationally hard problems. Uh, but if you use a quantum computer, there's a possibility that you could do it in a much more sophisticated manner. Now, the key message I took from this interview is that quantum computers are fundamentally different than traditional computers. They will not replace the traditional. There will always be a place for both. Now, for the full 30-minute interview where we get into deeper topics like using quantum computers for game-playing neural network AIs, please head over to the Ludology feed at ludology.net. You can also find more details about quantum computing by downloading the Hello Quantum app and going to Kiskit. Dot org. That's Q-I-S-K-I-T dot org, where you can download open source tools to learn more about and actually program a quantum computer. This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. Tom. 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 Uh, yeah, Tom. Tom. Hi, Tom. Paul. Have you ever accidentally eaten one of your game pieces? Do you ever make a fort out of game boxes? How big can a miniature be before it's not really a miniature? And now, the Dice Tower will authoritatively, definitely... Possibly, maybe, answer your questions. Oh, uh, Tom, which way to the game library? Joseph starts us off today saying, Watching the latest Top 100, a very evident fact became evident. There seems to be no one on the Dice Tower team who's hot on heavy euros. Meanwhile, there are several heavy euros in the Top 100 BGG list. Any chance of hearing more on this kind of genre on your shows? Well... Anytime someone says this, it, what they mean is they mean extremely heavy euros because we all play heavy euros. For example, mm. we were just talking about dominations. That's a heavy euro, whether yeah. you want to admit it or not. It is, yes. Compared to 99% of the games out there, it's heavier than there. But what you want is even heavier than that. Happily on the video channel, we have <laughs> Ambi Valdez uh, from Board Game yes. Blitz, and she loves these heavy games. I believe Mandy likes a lot of them, too. And Mandy um, does. I will dabble, but I, I, tend to, I tend to lean more middleweight these days. Yeah, so either how, 
It was just a really fantastic. There, there's so many great games out there. And, you, you know, you could say there should be someone covering a specific type. We just try to get people who like games a lot. <laughs> Adam says, as some of the longest and most respected board game content creators. Who's he talking to, Eric? I don't know. Maybe maybe it's somebody else. Oh, yeah. Well, we intercepted the question. We should answer You've anyway. inspired a number of people who make content today. So what do you think helps popularize in board game what do you think you help popularize in board game content creation? And who do you currently get inspiration from? And one piece of advice for anyone looking to make content about board games or be a Dice Tower contributor. So the first one, which is the egotistical question, is what do you think we help popularize? Standing in front of wall of games? Man, Eric, no joke I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I jumped in. Uh, I mean, it's the cliche yeah. now. Um, I think that's the one thing I I know that people I mean, have copied. It's an easy backdrop. It makes sense. Yeah, it's not like – and uh, you know, anytime I say that too, it's it's not like I had this brilliant idea. I just thought let's stand in right front now. of games. And if I hadn't done it, the very next person to review would also have done it, right? Yes. It's only because I was one of the first reviewers and Scott Nicholson was busy running around outside with his camera. <laughs> um, I think, see, I don't know because I would say top tens and we definitely popularized that top 10 thing, but it's not like top tens hadn't been done before. No, there was this late night guy that did it a lot. Right. The only argument I might say is that David Letterman's top tens were always to be silly and funny. Our top tens, we were trying to give you actual top tens. And then we started arguing up to Wazoo about them. So there's True. that. I don't know. Yeah, I just yeah, whatever. But where do we get inspiration from? <laughs> For me, everywhere. Anytime I watch something funny or interesting and just hanging out with the guys in the studio or talking, I think of funny ideas and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But uh, I don't know. I'm I'm constantly getting inspired by the people who are doing entertainment in the board gaming sphere. Uh people like Paula Deming. Uh, with with like sketch comedy and Ambie's uh, musical parodies and um, the just the the entertainment from a board gaming perspective is is really fun for me. And then piece of advice when making content about board games, we get asked this a lot. Yeah, I I mean find your own voice. It it doesn't work to to copy what somebody else is doing because that's the way it's quote unquote done. Find your perspective. You know, what, what can you as a person, an individual perspective uh, contribute, which is great. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I there's a lot of piece of advice. So I try to give a different one maybe uh, each time, but I think one would be don't get caught up in the negativity that you will eventually get from some people who listen, watch your show. You can learn mm. from advice, that's for sure. If 65 people tell you your camera's crooked, there you go. But if one person <laughs> comes on and says you're an idiot, a moron, you're boring, you're ugly, whatever, who cares? You know, don't let that get you down. Concentrate on the positive feedback you get. Try to improve, but don't worry about that negative stuff. Nick is asking, what is your gaming weakness, your gaming kryptonite? I will share mine to provide some context to the question. I struggle in engine building games at not going for the quick wins. The five or ten points that are the quick grab but don't offer long-term benefits. I guess I just get scared of falling behind early and need to see something providing an early return. As an engine builder, this certainly works to hurt my long-term prospects. So, after airing my dirty laundry, what are yours? I think for me... Um, I, I tend to ignore the stack of cards, um, that offer some sort of end game bonuses. Like if you've got several options on your turn and you can, uh, you can trade, you can move, you can collect, you can harvest, or you can go to the town hall and select from this stack of cards, which there'll be lucrative things at the end of the game. I totally ignore that stack of cards because it's this unknown nebulous thing. I can see the other stuff, but that stack of cards, and this is to my peril because 
the players who go, I'm thinking of um oh King it's no, it's one of the key games. Uh Cathedral is one of these. That you can get these lovely little benefit cards and they're amazing. But I totally don't go there because it's this stack of cards. I don't know what's there. I, is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna do the things that I can see. So that unknown stack will get me every time. I am easily destroyed by getting so caught up in having a great game that I forget to try to win. It, this happens in <laughs> engine building games, and I'll be like, this one lets me draw three cards and gives me four money. And mm-hmm. pretty soon I'm like, ho, 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 I'm getting 64 money a turn and drawing 17 cards. Was I supposed to get victory points somewhere in there? But my engine's so cool. <laughs> And I sometimes just forget I'm to rich. make that hard turn. Like, oh, yeah, well, mm-hmm. I lost a lot, but I did something cool. And I guess my other kryptonite is just that Timmy thing. I want to do this amazingly cool thing, which will be fun. Uh-huh. Control the giant monster, you know, get victory points for being the only person to do something that I will ignore. Good strategy to do the fun thing. <laughs> you want to push the buttons. All right, yes. Big Ben says, is there a good resource for replacing missing or damaged board game components? Not Asmodee. Mm-hmm. Um, I recently lost two cardboard shits to one of my favorite games, and he didn't want to replace the whole game, but where is he supposed to get this? You know, he just needs 10 cents of cardboard. <sighs> he says that his friendly local game store does offer parts from games that were sold, traded, but they don't have parts for this particular game. And everything online is generic replacement. Meeples, discs, and it's hard to find an exact replacement. I was contacted by someone who was thinking about doing this, but the logistics of this are horrific. Mm. Yes. Because you would have to keep, let's say, how many games would you have to keep? So let's say someone's missing a card for a game. So I buy a game, I'm like, I will sell parts. Right. And I sell you the card for that game. And then Eric misses the exact Exact same same card. card. And I'm like, what a jerk. (laughs) <laughs> yep. <laughs> Most publishers, though, will have replacement parts for their games if it's still in print. If it's not in print. But they basically just opened up copies of their games. I mean, they just have a couple copies on the shelf that are parts copies. It's the same thing. That's true. That's very true. Um, Yeah, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, I mean, the... The, you might try searching on that games forum on Board Game Geek uh, to see if anyone has made. Sometimes some people will make an upgraded set of tokens. Um, I'm going back to Merchant of Venus again, but a friend of mine made um, upgraded plastic tokens for for the IOU markers that are hidden at the beginning of the game, and. If you ever lost one of those, you'd need to replace it with something that could be the same as the other 13 in the game. So getting a whole new set of that style of token may be an option. I don't know exactly what Big Ben is missing here. But you can also, Board Game Geek has a um, a system, want parts, um, you know, parts needed. And you may be able to find someone who also has a damaged copy that may have the couple of things you need. Hmm, Okay. Richie says, Tainted Grail made a lot of people's favorite game of 2019. It looks pretty cool. Now, I was a backer of the base game with stretch goals, so you'd think I'd have it, right? Apparently, I missed the fact that you had to do Wave 1 shipping, which costs extra. So even though I backed the game, I won't get the best game of 2019 until late 2020, possibly 2021, with the coronavirus mess. Can you be Game of the Year if you only paid for early shipping? I think Awakened Realms learned from this and just sent an explicit mail for Etherfields, making it clear that I'd have to explicitly pay more to get Etherfields ASAP. So that's good. I'm worried about this trend. FOMO, fear of missing out, but pay to get it shipped now. I am particularly annoyed at Tainted Grail because I backed at a base level but still had to pay extra to get the base game early. Tim, Eric, do you have any thoughts? Who's Tim? <laughs> I, think he, I think he's talking to you. Okay. I actually really like what Awakened Realms does here. Um, so this has happened 
there's a big to do about this with uh, come on right now, but that's a slightly yep. different situation. So let me explain. Okay. So what uh, Awakened Realms does is they have these big games that come out, these giant games, Tainic Grails 1, for example, and it comes with a ton of extra stuff, and you can do one-wave shipping or two-wave shipping. One-wave means you pay less, but you got to wait till everything's done before you get it. You're sure. going to wait for a year, probably more than everybody else. But if you do the two-wave shipping, it costs more, but you get the base game. Not all the cool Kickstarter stuff. That will come later, about a year later. Mm-hmm. So I had this happen to me with Lords of Hellas. I got Lords of Hellas. I played it. It was super fun. I said, man, I'd love to play with some additional content. And a year later, the additional content showed up, and I was like, woohoo. It's like you've pre-ordered an expansion. I Yes, yeah, right. I, I've, done, I've done nothing with Tainted Grail. I, I mean, I, I have played it, but I'm I not finished with it yet. And I think when I finish with it, then the other two gigantic scenarios will show up yay so let's see just a couple days ago i got my starcadia quest from uh come on Mm -hmm. this came all together okay oh my (laughs) it came in this giant box that a a, a small family could live inside oh so many pieces so much stuff i'm like wow i'm just drowning in all the plastic and cool things now i like that but I'm okay learning the base game and then adding this stuff later on. If I get all the yeah. stuff right away, I'm tempted to start playing with a lot of that cool extra stuff <laughs> before I should. Now, they are very clear on this. You don't have to do that if you want the base game or the other one. You have to pay more to get the base game first, but it's completely up to you. It's not that they're trying to get FOMO. It's just that they're printing it in these two waves, and yes – and sometimes even developments going into the second wave. You don't have to get it in two waves, but that's up to you. I personally prefer to get it in two waves because I get the base game and add other stuff. Yeah. Now, what Command just recently did is they didn't mention that they were going to do two waves until after the Kickstarter. Then they said, "Yeah, you can get it in two waves, but you pay more shipping. Same thing, basically. Mm-hmm. The difference is they also were selling it in retail at the same time. So in August, they're going to sell the game in retail. And if you only wanted the base game, you didn't even need to back the Kickstarter. Uh, so Awaken yes. Realms doesn't do that. Well, you didn't get all the Kickstarter bonuses that you'd get for backing the base game. That is true. That is true. And there were a but lot you... for that campaign. And so people are still annoyed about the having to pay for extra shipping. And they're not even getting anything other people don't have. It's also going to retail stores at the same time. Now, I don't want to get into a big thing on whether that's right or wrong, per se. I'm not saying that come on is wrong for doing that. I just see how people can be annoyed by it. Mm-hmm. I can see that people think that the places are charging money for extra shipping. I'm dealing with shipping costs right now for my own Kickstarter. They're a bear. <sighs> yeah. And likely they're going to get worse. It's a pain to ship everything and get all that stuff done. Mm-hmm. Two-wave shipping, I think, is a good solution, especially if you know about it ahead of time. I would always pick two-wave shipping myself. I'd rather yep. pay a little bit more to split up me getting the game. Well, I, uh, I, Not I'm to mention in on this. Uh, that extra stuff doesn't matter. I, I'm in on the, the Come On uh, Marvel game. And uh, I just, in fact, right before recording, I chose my two-wave shipping because I'm hoping to do just as you said – uh, introduce the game to my kids, just the base game, and then it'll be like this, you know, big surprise when the new stuff comes and we're ready for the expansion and all the new Kickstarter exclusives and all that fun stuff. Uh, so I'm I'm actually looking forward to getting it in waves, uh, just so we're not overwhelmed. I just realized I haven't filled mine out. Wow. Well, I don't think the no- the notices are just going out, so you should be all set. Wait, this is 44 minutes ago. I, I, I've been recording for more than 44 minutes. I just happened to stumble upon it. I was like, I wonder if that's up yet. And yeah, it let me in. So This is the most relevant question we've ever done. <laughs> it's like hot news right here. How far in did you go on that, uh, on that Marvel game, Tom? None of your business. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love so this Marvel. Was my first, that's all you need to know. This was my first experience with a Come On product. So I, I know that a lot of this is, is uh, you know, well-worn territory for them. But you know, they presented this base game. And I'm like, yeah, great. I'm in. And then there were all these optional 
buys, optional expansions that you could just up your pledge and add, you know, a $25 box or a $30 box. And and then they added another base pledge that included some of the expansions that I was already going to buy. So, well, okay, fine, I'll just do that. And that came with extra stuff. And then they kept adding more extra stuff. And so I eventually went with the Infinity Pledge, which was the base game and the Infinity Gauntlet. And the they threw in the Black Panther for free. Uh, and then... Um, I paid for Spider-Man and Guardians of the Galaxy, but I left Thor and the Sinister Six on the table. How could you get Spider-Man and not the Sinister Six? I don't even know really. Here's who the, the problem Sinister with Six this are. particular campaign. I just got Starcadia Quest, like I said. I got big boxes full of stuff. I didn't get everything yeah. for Starcadia Quest. When it came to the end, there were some optional add-ons that I did not add on. Why? Because it's Doctor Bruchevag and. You know, alien this I don't know who those people are. Yep. In Marvel, though, you know who they are. If you, you don't do. do it, you don't get Hawkeye. Yeah. Well, no, it's not even just me. There's a lot of people, especially like the Guardians of the Galaxy. You get some of them. You want <laughs> the other ones? Kickstarter only, please. Right. Uh, I have to say the Marvel United Kickstarter was a master class in Kickstarter – Salesmanship. I want. I was about to say manipulation. That, that's that, that's a little bit more negative than I prefer to be. It yeah. They it was orchestrated. Knew how to? Wow. The, I mean, you go watch that. You watch the updates. You watch how they did it. They took a campaign that we. I was watching. I was like, they should be making more than this. And they ended with quite a bit of money. Mm. It. The way they ran that campaign was masterful. <laughs> masterful. Well, yeah. All right. Wendell says, first of all, he says that he likes uh, watching our reviews, especially reviews of bad games. But <laughs> he says, have we ever considered uh, – how do you say that word, Eric? Co- corollary? Uh, corollary. I don't know how to pronounce it. Corollary. Why can't I – okay. To your yearly top 100 to be quickly addressed the games that have fallen completely off the list. I don't think it's be comprehensive. Just why – he goes, just a quick rundown on the new corpses. <laughs> They're and not so dead. Like, what happened to Star Trek fleet captains or chameleons? And that's the thing. I, I, I might do that at some point, but I think people don't realize if if I have ten games I really like and I suddenly play a new game and it moves to number five, that doesn't mean the ten games started stinking more. <laughs> it just had to move down right. because of math. There are more games. And so this now. happens with games all the time. Now, yes, some games do fall off the list considerably. And I do mention that occasionally because I'm like liking them less. But most of the time, it's just because they got crowded off by games I like more. Mm-hmm. And I think people read too much into that, honestly. Yeah. People read too much into stuff at all. Like you go to Board Game Geek and you'll see a game and it's ranked 754 and you're like, this is garbage. <laughs> That's 754 out of over 100,000 games mm. and expansions. Yeah. There's a ton. So – that's really good. Yeah. It's all relative. You used all to relative. do this as part of your top 100, I mean, years ago, didn't you? I do it sometimes, though. I, I, I will occasionally do it. I just don't know. I don't feel like it's something I, I have to do. Hmm. I think sometimes it's interesting to talk about. But again, I really feel like people put too much emphasis on it. Okay. Drew says, I've been listening for a while and greatly enjoy when you two bicker over your difference in opinions concerning games. Logistico springs to mind. Even though it happens often and it always seems like it's in good fun, I am left to wonder if there are any games which have actually caused strife between you two to the point where you still harbor some irritation with the other's opinion. This is a safe space. Hmm. You know, okay, so this is an interesting thing. I I, I don't – well, maybe Eric will say differently. I don't think we've ever had actual strife over a board game or, for that matter, anything. <laughs> Except the one time Eric got irritated because we went and saw Penn and Teller three years in a row. That was a mild irritation, but it was three years ago. <laughs> like, it was basically it was, the same act. It was a thing, Eric. Eric, it was a thing. I couldn't control it. I was – well, I could control it, but I I just – I, it was a thing. It was a thing. Um, Yeah. No, Eric and I don't really argue that much, even mildly, I don't think. 
No, not it's really. I don't Eric. think he's just a nice guy. We argue on we argue on the show, but a lot of that is more showmanship than anything else. Sure. I mean, the logistical thing's a little annoying, but I've I've heard it so many times now that I, uh, you know, I, I pretty much preemptively argue against it. He could be wrong. I'm not mad at him for it. Right. Except wrong. But yes, right. <laughs> um, I don't really. I'm trying to think. Like difference of opinions on games, I don't think has ever got me upset with anybody no like if i hate a game like my most hated game and you told me you loved it or my favorite game and you told me it's awful that's okay i i I mean we it will make for a good old-fashioned fun argument but at the end of the day i i don't know i do think it's weird sometimes when i think someone has a weird irrational opinion (laughs) that's not eric you can jump to the video part of life to see that was occasionally. <laughs> um, and I've occasionally said, how can this person think such a thing? But even then, at the end of the day, it's they're just fun opinions. That's why I like board games so much. One of the reasons. Hmm. And I like talking about them. Because it's so much fun to talk about them. And we can get all passionate about them. But at the end of the day, this stuff doesn't matter. It's just games. They're here for I don't, fun. I don't sit there and go... Oh, that's right. I better not mention, you know, Monopoly online because, you know, then I'm going to get all these people upset with me. It's not it's not a third rail topic. No. You know, we can talk about this stuff. We can get passionate about it. But at the end of the day, we all go home and we're all friends. And well, maybe not the designers of the games that we've trashed. That's a different story. But there is uh, that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I don't I know. Trash vicious it, fishes but even much. that is pretty good. No, you can trash my games. It doesn't bother me. But And most designers and publishers who we have said negative stuff have been fairly easygoing. And we're still friends with most of them. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I think, we're, I think it's all good. All good. At least as long as we're still rolling. Are we off? Because there was that one time. Eric, shut up. Oh, are we still going? I'm not kidding. I mean, oh, we're good. Oh, we're on the air? Um, Oh, thank you, Eric. Let's go to the top ten. Yes, let's Sir? do that, boss. It's a dice tower top ten. The dice tower's top ten list is brought to you by the Op, also known as USA Opoly, at theop.games. Okay, folks. Wow. So this is interesting to me as we look back at the year two thousand five, because as Eric was just pointing to me off air. This is one of the first – this might be the f- – actually, this is the first year that we recorded the podcast was in 2005. It was. October, I think, 2005. And so this was one of the first times I did a top 10 games from that year. And my tastes have changed a bit since that time. <laughs> okay. And then I'm looking back – Five years later, in 2010, we did it at Best Games from a Decade Ago. That was Dice Tower episode 391. This is, what, 651? 651, yeah. Whew. And even then, I believe my tastes have changed. And in fact, what? Is this, is this game also from 2005? Am, am I just not good at looking up games these days? I, I don't know, maybe. I'm still kind of a, a noob at this sort of thing. And so, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you'll eventually get used to doing top 10 lists. All right. Well, I'm making changes on the fly. There we go. All right. Now I've looked at these lists. <laughs> some things have changed and some games have dramatically fallen off for me. But there's some mm-hmm. reasons for that. And I'll mention a little bit of that at the end or on Eric's list when he brings them up. Sure. So I think I think I'm ready to go, Eric. Let's do it. Oh, yeah. Number 10. Let's begin with a game that's no longer on Tom's list because he just took it <laughs> off. As of it just dropped off the bottom like 30 seconds ago. Descent, Journeys in the Dark. Uh, I, I first got introduced to this um, with uh, John Richard from uh, Game On with Cody and John. He taught me how to play this game. It is a, a cooperative dungeon crawl. Uh, I like the dice system in Descent, and uh, a lot of the elements of this game were later re-implemented in uh, Star Wars Imperial Assault, a game I really enjoy as well. Um, it, it's a cool system and a fun adventure. My number 10 from 2005, Descent. 
And really, the only reason is it's not on my list is because of Descent 2nd Edition and Imperial Assault. Both have surpassed it. I was putting it on my list as more of a nod than anything else, but then I sure. thought of another game that knocked it off. <laughs> my number 10 was number one in 2005, so it's dropped down. Wow. No, it was number one, I'm sorry, five years ago. Yeah, yeah, the 2010 version or the 2015 version of this list. I had not played it in 2005 because I saw it at a convention and didn't play it because it was a miniatures game, but I play it now, Battleground Fantasy Warfare. This is a game, if you've never seen it, where it's a miniature game, straight up, but all your miniatures are cards. And so you just you move these cards around the table so I can buy a pack of cards, and that's a huge army. And I think there's like 10 factions for it now. It suffers a lot of problems from miniatures games. There's a lot of rules, a lot of different things. It has some cool concepts, like all your armies on the board are just going to keep moving the way you tell them to do until you change their orders, and you can only change orders of a few armies at a time. Which is a nice way to handle it, because if I tell you this guy's to run and enclose with the enemy, they're probably going to do that. You know, there's not some magical earpiece they all have that says, stop, turn 360. Uh, so I really like this game. I know that they were they tried to kickstart it recently, and it should be reprinted soon. I don't play it as much because it's hard to find opponents for miniature games, really, especially without miniatures. There's actually cards, but I still like it. Battleground Fantasy Warfare. Number nine. My number nine has fallen a couple slots in the last five years. It was my number six when we did this uh, in 2015. That's Glory to Rome. Uh, this this uh, hits people a little bit uh, with the, the turbulent publishing history that this game has had, and we may never see another edition of Glory to Rome. Uh, but it is the first big hit from Carl Chuddick. Uh, and and his first to use the multi-use cards, which is one of those uh, hallmarks of Chuddick's designs these days. And you you can uh, use them as actions, you could use them as buildings, and and it's a cool system. Um, and a lot of the seeds from this game have shown up in other Chuddick designs that have come out since then. Uh, so you can still get a good sense of Glory to Rome, even if you can't get it. But it's a a nice landmark from this era. From 2005. My number nine, Glory to Rome. My number nine is Mission Red Planet. Uh, This is a game that has been on the list a whole two minutes. uh, (laughs) Because I just remembered it. Because it was number six five years ago. And I was like, how did I miss that? I really like Mission Red Planet. Especially the remake of it. It's the same game with some minor tweaks. But this area control game where you send people up to Mars... I've I've always found fantastically fun. It's quick. It scales up to six people and not overbearingly so. A lot of fun. Mission Red Planet. Number eight. My number eight is the granddaddy of worker placement. That's Kalis. Uh, a lot has been said about it. New additions have have uh, recently been released of Kalis, and it's a it, it can be a very mean worker placement game if, if the group is really maneuvering that provost to go back up the trail to make those actions not work. Um, my group never really wanted to do that, so it wasn't as much of a threat. But still, uh, Kalis is a nice, heavy, uh, deep worker placement game um, and one that has a lot to enjoy uh, with multiple plays. Kalis, number eight. Yeah, I think you're right about that. It all depends on how the group wants to play. I played a game with someone, and it only takes one person. One person can start moving that provost, and then everyone's mm-hmm. on board. I recently played the updated version of it, which is Kalis 1343, I think, or something like that. Yep. It's Kalis with a date. <laughs> so if you, there's no date on the front of the It's uh, Kalis 1303. Okay. Uh, And I think they streamlined it a lot. 14 years later, it came out in 2019. uh, I think this kind of replaces the original Kalos for me, even though it's basically the same thing. All righty. Well, my number eight is higher in Eric's list, and I just gambled and lost again. Hmm. Number seven. My number seven is a Gold Zebra Editions game called Krita. Um, it's, I believe it's a Stefan Dora game. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's an area control game uh, where you've got the island of Crete and uh, you are, you're trying to control different sections of this and placing different types of pieces, playing cards that allow you to do this. And it has sort of a sliding timeline of the resolution of these zones. The zones are, are numbered and um, they will 
score, but you can only see like the next, the current one that's about to score and then the next two. So if you're losing in one zone, you might start working on the next one and, you know, get a, a leg up on the people who are still working on the current zone. And that sort of tipping point decision is really cool in Krita, my number seven. Yeah, this is one of the few games on the list I still have yet to play. Mm -hmm. Maybe never will happen. <laughs> My number seven is a really fun game that I've been sitting around thinking I should play lately, and that's Nexus Ops. This is a little miniature game, a people-on-a-map style game, where you're moving around giant insects and things, and it's really a simple game where you just move into enemy territories and attack them and roll dice and see what happens. But it really encourages attacking. It's very quick, has some really cool fluorescent miniatures. The original one did. The uh, Fantasy Flight upgrade later on did not. But this game from Avalon Hill, the Avalon Hill reprints, I really enjoyed this a lot. Simple, fast, and fun. Nexus Op is my number seven. Mm -hmm. And this is often uh, cited as a great replacement for Risk. If you're a Risk fan, Nexus Ops is a good, better, quote-unquote, replacement number six my number six uh dropped off my list five years ago but i believe it was there 10 years ago when i first did this list and now the sheep are back sheer panic uh which is the first big hit for fragor games um fraser and gordon lamont it has these adorable sheep and you are positioning them and running them up against fences and pushing them around and trying to get them into scoring position, basically, uh, at different points of the game. And they're just adorable. I also have the, the first edition, which is very portable, so it has not left my collection. Later editions came in a much larger box with a, a board, um, but the original was just, it, you just sort of moved the sheep around the table. So, sheer panic, number six. This is kind of weird that um, we both put a, an abstract strategy game for a number six. Hmm. Sheer, Sheer Panic is definitely one that has really dropped off the radar for me. Sure. Uh, it's it's okay. It's 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 interesting, but wow, did this one disappear off the radar. But so did mine, although mine I think is available in, in more mainstream way, and that's Pentago. Yeah. Pentago, get five in a row. That's all it is. It's a board with a 16, uh, well, an 8 by 8 grid, and you have these four squares and you put a marble down and you're trying to get five marbles in a row but you put a marble down then you must rotate one of the four sections that's it very simple very fast very fun i still enjoy this i have a really pretty deluxe version of it in the dice tower library that no one ever plays but it's there <laughs> my number six Pentago. number five my number five i'm pretty sure is going to show up on tom's list because he's an extremely trustworthy knight <laughs> My number five is a game that I've enjoyed for a long time. I haven't played this one in a bit, and that's Railways of the World. Oh, and though in 2005, 2005, it was called Railroad Tycoon, the board mm -hmm. game. This was a reworking of Age of Steam in a nicer, gentler, bigger way with plastic miniatures, <laughs> and I liked that combo. Yep. Uh, lots of fun all around. It lets you build these tracks and deliver goods in a more easygoing way and still a very good game. There's many, many expansions for it. I like them. My number five, Railways of the World. I still own Railways of the World. I do not own Age of Steam or Steam, um, but it's not really my favorite of the three uh, versions of that system. It is almost too big. It's such a – it's got giant boards and the big plastic minis, and it takes up a lot of table space. So it hasn't really hit the table as much for me as I would like. Number four. My number four was my number two five years ago. That's Indonesia. Uh, this is the splatter game about Indonesia. Uh, you can harvest different crops. You can even combine, what is it, spice and rice, I think, to make siop faji microwave meals. Uh, you could own the shipping company what? that sends – yeah. It, that, that's one of the goods that you can evolve if you own both a rice and a spice um, plantation. You can start making siap faji. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's pretty cool. Anyway, uh, you can buy the shipping companies and, and send these goods to cities and uh, increase their demand for them. And um, It's a mathy game for sure, but one I love. Number four. 
Indonesia. My number four is at the very other end of the complexity scale, <laughs> and that is Diamant. Uh, Diamant is was redone later on as Ink and Gold, although the Diamant production still really awesome. This push your luck game where you decide how far into the cave to go still gets played for me today, and I still have never won and never <laughs> will. Well, no, <laughs> there will be a day I will win Diamant by the biggest score on Earth. Someday. Until that happens. Someday when, when you're in the board game rest find home, find the gold, and then I'll jump up and cheer, and immediately break a leg, a hip. <laughs> I broke a hip from happiness. It's worth it. Diamant, my number four. Number three. My number three was Tom's last minute number eight, and that is Vegas Showdown. It was in this exact same position five years ago, and there's a reason for that. This is a classic. Uh, you are running a casino. You are uh, doing the the types of auctions that you may be familiar with if you've played Amun Ray. Um, as you buy slot machine rooms and restaurants and uh, other amenities for your casino. And you're trying to position them so that the hallways all connect to each other and earn money. And, and uh, it's, it's really cool. It's a neat game. And uh, it, it's one that has, has really continued to stay on the top after all of these years. Vegas Showdown is my number three. What do you think, Tom? Yeah, it's just a great game. This is actually a game I didn't enjoy when I first played it, but I don't know. I was just wrong. Uh, I like the building of the casino. That part's fun. I like the auction styles. It just It's really well done. And for crying out loud, will someone reprint this with good components already? Hmm. Come on. Nice player, I'm mats. still waiting. Yeah. Uh, but I do like it despite the lower component quality. My number... My number, what was it for me? Eight. Eight. And Eric's number three, Vegas Showdown. Speaking of Vegas, my number three is higher on Eric's list. Number two. And here it is. My number two, uh, I actually flip-flopped with Indonesia. Wits and Wagers was my number four last time. What's made it move up, I think, is the fact, is it staying power? Wits and Wagers is a trivia game uh, in which you don't necessarily need to know the answers. You just have to know uh, who might know it better than you, uh, because after everyone has answered the trivia question, you then wager on who has gotten it correct. And sometimes that can be more lucrative if you bet in the right positions and bet with the right strategy uh, than necessarily knowing the answer in the first place. And Tom and I have run countless games of this at various events all over the place. Um, most recently at Dice Tower West, we did a run of this, and it's always a blast. It can scale from just a few players to seven players to giant groups of people playing as teams. Wits and Wagers is a great system, great game. My number two. Yeah, fantastic. Can't say enough. We talk about this game a ton as it is. Love it a lot. Wits and Wagers. My number two was Eric's number five, and that is Shadows Over Camelot. Now, this is the one that I think at some point we might see maybe a sequel or a reprint. I don't know. I'm just making that up. I don't know. Maybe. But it'd be, it'd be cool to see this kind of reinvigorated in our industry because this is a game that really – this and Pandemic both put cooperative games on the map back in 2005. Right. Pandemic was, what, 2008, I think, a few years later? That sounds right. Something like that. But Shadows Over Camelot kind of paved the way because – it took Reiner Kinesia, who had Lord of the Rings, which was a very puzzly cooperative game, and Shadows Over Camelot added a fun theme to it. I mean, it was a pace it on theme, but it was fun. Sure. And so I really enjoy this one. I like the traitor aspect to it, which has been duplicated in many, 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 many games since. Mm -hmm. And great component quality. This one, if it came out today, you might think it came out in 2020. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'd like to see maybe the systems updated just a little bit, but I, this one gets a lot of credit for being the first. There may have been other trader games uh, available before this, but this is really the one that put that concept on the map and paved the way for stuff like Battlestar Galactica uh, years later. And and the the glory, the moment when you you know make a move to place the last war engine siege engine in front of the castle when everybody thought you were going to run and and get the lady of the lake track finished it it's glorious when that sort of thing would happen and you had fooled everyone because you were the traitor very cool game shadows over camelot 
And finally, number one. My number one was my number one five years ago, and that is Antica, the Mac Gertz Rondell game. Um, the this is my favorite of the Rondell games, uh, where you have a circular action track and you can move a certain number, but you can pay to move a little bit farther on that track. You are collecting resources, then using those resources to build up your your presence uh, on this map of um, you know uh, the the Mediterranean region, actually, and uh, you are are getting. Armies, you are building uh, temples, you are achieving goals, uh, which is what I really like. It's actually a race uh, as you try and achieve a certain number of goals to to win the game. We actually see this sort of thing in um, in Scythe uh, these days, where you are you can do lots of things to earn these victory conditions, but if you do that more efficiently and quicker than your opponents, then you'll run away with the victory. Uh, there's a tech tree. Um, there's all sorts of ways to earn these points. Antica is my number one. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I've i never put – no, no. I can't really knock you too much for Antica because I've only played Antica Duel. Right. I didn't really I'm care for sure it. I'm sure better. Yeah. yeah, so I can't really say a lot. Number one clearly is Twilight Struggle. It just is a great Cold War game. Best game of the year. This one was an easy one for me to pick. I still think this game is fantastic. Uh, the, I'm really looking forward to, I think, Imperial Struggle is the sequel of sorts coming out later this year. So that's going to be exciting. But if you want the Cold War in a box, then you need to play Twilight Struggle. Great two-player game from GMT. Hmm. That's different from a cold I, in a box. You don't want that. No, no, you don't. All right, People's Choice, number 10, you guys said Railways of the World. Number 9, Arkham Horror. Hmm. It's weird to think that this is Arkham Horror's second edition, of course. Arkham Horror came out earlier than that, but second edition was the most well-known one. 8, Vegas Showdown. 7, Kalis. 6, Animal Upon Animal. A great kids it's game. It's one of the most popular kids games, yeah. So happy to see that one make the list. Number 5, Diamant. Number 4, Wits and Wagers. 3, Shadows Over Camelot. Two, Ticket to Ride Europe. Yeah. I think Ticket to Ride's amazing. I just didn't put it on because I already picked Ticket to Ride for 2004. It's basically the same game. And number one, Twilight Struggle. Remember, if you want to vote in these, all you have to do is go to our website, dicetower.com, and you can vote too. What else are you doing right now? Go vote. Have fun. <laughs> and that's it for another episode. Uh, thanks, folks, for joining us. We really appreciate it each of you listening we'd love to hear your feedback remember we have different forums you can check out on our website and on facebook so we'll hopefully we'll talk to you there and see you on our youtube channel got anything else there uh no i'm i'm just gonna go back to trying to convince my my kids to play new games so we can talk about them here because that's my whole game group at this point <laughs> <clears throat> that's right next time kids games a la mode well <laughs> until then i'm tom vassal i'm eric summer And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode number 651 was recorded on March 19th, 2020. Mandy and Suzanne join you next week, and in two weeks, it's our top 10 games starting with N. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. If a catastrophic event has become more than you can handle, find out how we can help at jackvassal.org. And you can help out the fund right now with our auction on Board Game Geek. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Mandy, Suzanne, and Eric, with assistance from Rob Searing, Mike Delisio, and Roy Kennedy. Bad advice for folks playing Animal Crossing is provided by Trash Your Island. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and you can get the latest on everything Dice Tower at dicetower.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Tom at DiceTower.com or Eric at DiceTower.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network, including Dukes of Dice, Four Corners of the Board, Board Gamers Anonymous, Boards and Swords, Blue Peg, Pink Peg, The Geek All-Stars, The Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast, and Dice Tower Tonight. Find your next favorite at DiceTowerNetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. So at some point, is the library going to be full of just your your games that, that you'll never remove? I'm like, how many games are in the, the library that um, no matter how many times no one checks them out, 
they're still in there because you're, they're your favorites. I don't know. I pulled a couple out today. Sometimes you got to make a stand and then I put them back in. But still, they could have come out. Yeah, somebody, eventually somebody will take it out. Maybe, maybe you, listener. Maybe you. The PSA, only you can check out Pentagon.